Genesis chapter 9. We'll pick up right where we left off last week. We're not studying the Tower of Babel. What we're studying is salvation through your Bible. And there's, we pointed out last time that one way of looking at the incident of the Tower of Babel is to explain the purpose of God to choose out the nation of Israel. Because the Tower of Babel has to do with the dividing of the nations in the earth. And uh, as a judgment of God for the, for the sin of uh, not glorifying God as God and neither being thankful. I'll remind you of that in just a moment. Um, but uh, I just wanted to tell you that because we're not just studying the Bible in the historical event here. But understanding how this historical event changed the plan of God or... Uh, became a means by which God's plan for salvation was going to come through the nation of Israel. It gets changed again when the nation of Israel fails God and in the dispensation of grace God sends the Apostle Paul to all of mankind to offer us salvation again uh, through a different means and that is uh, uh, naturally through the cross of Christ but uh, through an, the agency of God's grace and not through the agency of the nation of Israel. Um, in Genesis chapter 9, just to pick up from the flood some of the things that we left off last week that we'll kind of fill in some details for you. In Genesis 9 verse 1 it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of, he of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and all the fishes of the sea into your hands are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood and your, uh, of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, at the hand of every man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man." Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And, be, and you be fruitful, and multiply, and bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, uh, help us to understand the things that are ancient history to us, uh, but the very means by which you're dealing with mankind today find its root back here and help us to see that progression as we look at the Bible. Help us to see and appreciate the salvation that you've offered to us through Jesus Christ. May the verses of Scripture here remind us our need of a Savior, how desperately wicked that we really are in our sinful condition, and how your great love has provided through your Son, his death, burial, and resurrection, eternal life for all who believe. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. The, uh, as I said, there's some events here that, that we just want to fill in, and then we'll kind of continue our study, though. But I wanted to point out to you that after the flood, there's a lot of things that changed here. And as Noah and his family come off the ark, remember there's just Noah, his three sons, and Noah's wife and the three sons' wives, so there's eight souls that were, that were spared in the ark, and then they come out into a new world, and verse 1, God blesses Noah and his sons, and then gives them that charge about replenishing the earth. Uh, he also, as you go down through the verses, we just read them so we won't read them again, but you'll see in those verses where there's now going to be a fear of animals toward man. Uh, remember there was wickedness in the earth before the flood and such great wickedness that God judged the world but he didn't just judge mankind there was wickedness in the animal kingdom as well as uh, men and, uh, and, and now there's going to be a whole different relationship between man and animals and uh, there's going to be a fear there but there's also going to be a change in the diet of man before the flood, man was only to eat of the green herbs and, and now he's, being, uh, he's uh, invited to and also the fruit, but now, now man is being uh, told that he can eat flesh, and that's part of also putting the fear of animals in man. It, there's a, a protection for one, one reason, because animals are going to become carnivorous as well. Some of those animals are going to want to eat men, 
And uh, so it's going to be a natural protection to have some fear of man in the animal. And then at the same time, it's going to be the survival of the animal if he's going to run from the man, and man's going to have to hunt the animal in order to eat it. So God changes that relationship between man and animal, and then uh, at the same time adds that diet to mankind, so that changes the dietary laws. And then there's this warning that whether an animal or a man sheds human life, that animal or that man is going to die. And capital punishment is introduced. That wasn't something when Cain killed Abel, that wasn't the, the law of the land then, but now God has instituted that. And, and that phrase, by man's uh, hands will... Man, uh, by the Verse 6, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. God has put the government of, of, of society into the hands of man. Such a high responsibility that man ha is going to have the means and the responsibility, uh, the, the decree from God, to execute a murderer among the group. And, and he's gonna, it's going to be the beginning of restricting evil in society. Because prior to that, society just got out of hand, and now there's a government being established. And as God divides the nations, as we see this is leading up to in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, as they are divided up, they have this now governing responsibility over the area in which they're going to be divided into. And so government is going to be established in the earth as man develops. Uh, but man's number one responsibility is to multiply and bring forth abundantly in verse 17 and multiply therein. That is, to multiply in the whole earth. And, uh, and you'll see that there is a rebellion against that. Now, as that's happening there, look over in verse 28. It says, and Noah, Genesis 9, 28, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So he lives before the flood 600 years, lives another 350 years after the flood before he finally dies. So Noah himself lived 950 years. He was that bridge between the life before the flood and the life after the flood, or as Peter says, the world that then was and the world that now is. That was a whole different world. Life was different there. One of the things that we studied before is we saw how the lifespan, the majority lived 900 and something years, and then, uh, and so Noah is one of the last, well, he is the last to live that long. If you just come over to chapter 10 and look, uh, no, chapter 11, verse 10. I'll just start down through here. It says, these are the generations of Shem. That's one of the sons of, Ham, of, of Noah. And it says, Ham was a 100, 100 years old and begot our fax dad two years after the flood. Now, none, there was no grandchildren. Noah had no grandchildren. But after the flood, they began to multiply in the earth like they were told to do. It says, And Shem lived, after he begot our fax dad, 500 years and begot sons and daughters. So he lived a total of 600 years. Our fax dad, as you go down through the verses, he lived to be 438 years. So here's Noah, 950, but his son lives only 600 years. His Noah's grandson only lives to live 438 years. And if you drop all the way down to verse 19, it says, And Peleg lived after he begot rule 209 years and begot sons and daughters. He, I have 39. Did I read that wrong? 209 years. Oh, that's after, okay, he, verse 18, he lived 30 years before that, so he lived 239 years. And so we've gone in, in just uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five generations from Noah. We've gone from 950 years down to 239 years. Look at uh, Abraham's grandfather, verse 25. And Nahor lived after Terah. 119 years and begot sons and daughters and you add the year, the 20 years before that he lived 148 years so from when you go th down through Genesis 11, uh, Genesis 11 and trace the genealogy of Shem and the life of Shem that you're going from Noah living 900, uh, 950 years to the grandfather of Abraham who lived only 148 years you're getting down to where the average life of man in Genesis 12 and following is twice about the lifespan of man currently today. And, uh, and so it just keeps going down, down, down till we get to the lifespan that we're, uh, we understand. Things changed after the flood. 
Probably, perhaps, the eating of meat, and the reason God would introduce that to the diet of mankind, is because the atmosphere was different. And, and the nutrition that man would need to live on the earth, God included something that would be helpful for him, and that he, he added that protein from the meat. And then, uh, and then you also see the lifespan of man changing. The earth is a whole different place on this side of the flood uh, than it was prior to the flood. And, and you just need to see those facts in that. Uh, hold your place in Genesis. Of course, that's what we're studying. But also take your bulletin, at least, and put it in, Matt, in Romans chapter 1. And look there at Romans chapter 1 with me at the things we saw at the close of last study. <coughs> In Romans chapter 1, we said that, there, that we understood that Roman, uh, Genesis chapters 9 through 11 is a, is a, a 500 year span of history that, that will take you from the time of, after the flood until the time of the Tower of Babel. And the purpose of the Tower of Babel is to explain how it is that God took the multiplied seed of Noah now and divided them in the earth. And uh, they were divided into families, they were divided into nations, they were divided into land, and they were divided into language because they wouldn't divide until God confused their language and then it caused them to be divided in the earth. They actually were rebelling against God. And, and so we started looking and realizing that when you come to Paul's epistles, it's important to realize that Paul tells us that as Gentiles, we were without God and without hope. But now in Christ Jesus, now in the age of grace, God has turned to us in His grace and is allowing us to be saved before He judges this world. That's what the dispensation of grace is about. And because Paul has now turned back to the Gentiles from Genesis 12 until the end of the book of Acts, the, the, the Bible is actually written to reveal God's purpose for the nation of Israel. You come to the book of Romans and now God has turned to us Gentiles to offer us salvation as this one last opportunity of grace before God judges the world. And Paul in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 is explaining how all of mankind came to the state that they're in. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That they're all under sin. And because of that situation, the cross of Christ is the only hope for mankind. And uh, of course, it it would have been the only hope for mankind any time, but, but being that, that this dispensation of grace is for all of mankind. So Paul is actually in Romans chapter 1 telling how the Gentiles fell. In Romans chapter 2 he's going to talk about the fall of Israel. In Romans chapter 3 he's going to offer salvation by God's grace as one last opportunity before the wrath of God is poured out. In, Gen in Romans chapter 1, in verse, uh, nine, uh, in verse 21, he explains what took place back at the Tower of Babel. And that, that's why it's important to see that connection. I, I took the time last week trying to explain all that because, let me, I want you to understand this, you do not, you will never understand even the basics of your Bible until you understand how important the Tower of Babel is to what the Bible's all about. To your, especially as a Gentile, to your roots, your relationship to God, what happened to the Gentiles? Why is the Bible all, almost all about Israel? Well, until you understood, understand the fall of the nations, then you don't understand the rise of the nation of Israel and God's purpose for them, and that their failure, and what the, ha, has responded God to, to do something, one that was never revealed in the Bible, and that is to offer us salvation by His grace in this dispensation of grace before He finally brings judgment to the earth. So it's real important to understand that event. And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it explains what's going on at the Tower of Babel that you need to add to your understanding of that event. It says, Because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but be became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. One of the things you always see is how when Israel is divided out, separated out from the nations, they're always told not to bow down to any graven image. And it's the Gentiles who had all these idolatrous things that they would worship. Well, it, that's what Paul's telling us here, is there came a time when every man knew God. The truth of God was known. 
But as they began to multiply after that flood and before God scattered them at the Tower of Babel, some things that were taking place, and what he says took place is, is that they glorified, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And we ended last class where I was looking at that, the meaning of what it means. What did they do to not glorify him as God? And that is they would not recognize or acknowledge the work of God in wonder and in amazement and appreciation. Rather, than, you know, especially if you think about them getting off the flood, and some, you know, Shem lives 600 years there, so he, he lived for a while, and the, the information about that flood is being passed down, but when they knew God, as they multiplied after the flood, it wasn't long before mankind no longer glorified God as God. They no longer looked at the judgment that God did and the provision of salvation that he brought to them and how they now are there on the earth to remultiply in the earth. They looked, looked away from all of that. They didn't appreciate God for what he has done. Neither were thankful for the salvation that he brought them. Then from that point of view, it says in verse 21, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So rather than understanding the things of God and appreciating the things of God, they just dismissed that and started in their own concepts of things, their own thinking of things, and as a result, their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, because the more they thought about things, the more they... <laughs> they, did, they did, no one professed them to be wise, they professed themselves to be wise. They're ignorant in their own conceit. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and then they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an images that they decided to worship instead of God. And then you get down to verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Now we're going to come back to Romans chapter 1. Go back to Genesis chapter 9. Now in Genesis chapter 9, we kind of, the way we're studying, we're just kind of jumping around in the chapter, but there's a section over here, they get off the flood, God gives them the new orders, God gives them a, a sign of the bow in the, in the clouds, which is another indication that the climate has changed, where now a bow, a bow can appear in the sky, and we understand how the sun works in that. The, the atmosphere of the earth didn't have rainbows before that, now it has rainbows. A testimony that God's not going to judge the world with flood again, which is really important because before the flood it never rained. Everything was watered, as the Bible says, from the roots underneath the ground. Uh, from a water system under the ground. All that sprung forth when the flood came. The windows of heaven were open and more water was added to the earth, saturating the whole earth, 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain. The whole earth's got a whole different geography and everything after the flood. And one of the things that changed is now it rains once in a while. Can you imagine the first time it rained after the flood? I mean, a good thunderstorm came over. Man, where where we put that ark? <laughs> They'd be scrambling back to that ark so fast. <laughs> but God puts that bow in the sky as a reminder that He's not going to judge the earth with water again. But it didn't, He didn't say I'll not judge the earth again. The next time it's going to be fire that judges the earth. But but after that, some things take place. Look at verse twenty. It says, And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken and was uncovered within his tent. Now, you're going to read some things here, and there's not going to be any rebuke upon Noah getting drunk from the wine that, he, uh, that he, he had there. But one of the things that you need to see right away, look at verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. Now, notice that phrase. Ham, the father of Canaan. We... No one, they don't even say any children were born yet. But one of the things you know when you read that, two things. One is some time has passed when you start verse 20. It, it's not like the first grapes that were grown since the time of the flood. Because Ham already has a child named Canaan. That's not even his firstborn child. You see in the list, that's like his fifth child. So, uh, so time has passed here. But the other reason it's there is we saw last week that you can read these and understand God's telling Israel something about their purpose in the earth. 
And God, the land that God gave the nation of Israel is called the land of Canaan. And there's going to be an explanation of why they're going to get the land of Canaan here uh, for them. But, but it just throws out Ham, the father of Canaan. Which then tells us that when it says in verse 20 that Noah began to be a husbandman in the earth. That's a farmer. And he planted a vineyard. That this isn't the first crop. In fact, he's probably put away some, want, some grape juice for some time now. And some of that old stuff that's been sitting in the, the bottle uh, is getting kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, toxic, <laughs> uh, fermenting, that's the word. And, and so it, it, it looks like it might have been just an accidental thing. He's drinking his old supply up, and as he does, he gets drunk and he falls asleep. So you see that taking place there. But, but Ham sees the nakedness of his father. It says, and so he tells his brothers, verse 20, 23, it says, And Shem and Japheth, took a garment and laid it upon their, their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their face were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. We pointed that out last time, how God is associated with Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God, uh, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. There's a fellowship there. And Canaan shall be his servant. So there's this cursing of Canaan. And two things, as you look at that, Noah wakes from his, his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So it makes you wonder, what did Noah do that Ham did to him? But then the second question is, he said, cursed be Canaan. <laughs> Why in the world did he curse Canaan? Why did he curse Ham if he did something wrong? Well, the, we're going to answer both those questions. What I want you to see as we're, as we're looking again at this Tower of Babel incident, it's not long after Noah and his family get off the ark that the corruption of the old world creeps back into the new world. Before the flood, it says, The wickedness of man was great in the earth, that all flesh has corrupted its way in the earth, and God judged the world. There were some things that were going on in that old world that Noah's sons knew about and got carried over in their minds and became actions in the new world, which the purpose of human government is to prevent from spreading in the earth. And, and when it says that, when it says that, that Ham looked on his father's nakedness, you know, in the Bible, under the law, uh, it says that a man is not to look upon a woman to lust after her. So when we talk about look, we're not just saying he walked by, oh, my dad was naked, I saw it, now I'm cursed. No, he stopped and looked. And then he didn't stop and look. Verse 24 says, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So there is some homosexuality that has spread from that old world into the new world. And, and when it says, cursed be Canaan, the reason that the cursing of Canaan, just look over in chapter 10. Now, God blessed Ham, but Ham had other children. And uh, in verse 6, it says, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. Oh, he's the fourth son. So it starts going through the list, and Canaan is that fourth son. But if you look down to verse 15, it says, And Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heath, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Argites, and the Sinites. And, and it starts naming, well, and the Ar Arvidites, <laughs> and the Zimorites, and the Hamer Hamathites, and after, afterwards, the families of the Canaanites were spread abroad. And the border of Canaan was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gera, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. And names the other area. It tells you where Canaan went and dwelt, and it tells you the people associated with Canaan, and the land that's associated with Canaan. When I see Canaan being cursed, you just wonder what's going on. Why would God curse? It does, it's not biblical. It doesn't seem right that Ham does something and Canaan gets cursed. Unless the action of Ham is something that has permeated his son's life 
the son of Canaan's life. And as we know, just from studying scripture, we know when we study Canaanites and what they were about and, and the area that they settled in, we know what this is all about. Um, which one do I want to go first? Let me get my mind thinking here. Well, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. Come over to chapter 13 of Genesis. This is now after Abraham was separated out from the nations. We're kind of looking ahead, but I want to show you something that took place here in, the, in that area that's called Sodom and Gomorrah, which you're probably familiar with, but, but look what, what happens. In Genesis chapter 13, this is where when Abraham separated out even after his dad died, and he's dwelling in the land of Canaan, down in verse 12. It says, And they dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot, Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So those people, the descendants of Canaan, when Abraham and his, his nephew Lot go into that area, they became so great that the verses above this, Abraham says to Lot, he says, look, you've got too many cattle to be mixing with me. The land can't support us. So we need to separate. Look which way do you want to go? And he looked over that, that toward the area of Sodom and the plain. It says it was as the Garden of Eden. He said, I want that area. So he went toward that, that territory. But it says there that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now you could pitch your tent any direction you want. But he's out, he picked that area and then he's from a distance watching what's going on in that city of Sodom. Come over in chapter 14. And this is where, uh, verse 1, it came to pass in the days of, oh boy. <laughs> it's not even hit my head. Anyhow, he's king of, of Shinar. Now that's that area of Babylon. So what happens in this chapter is that the, there's a bunch of kings that are going to get together and they're going to go and they're going to raid Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 11 it says, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and they're, they're Vicules, uh, and went their way, and they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Last we saw Lot, as he lived out in the field, pitched his tent towards Sodom. When these Gentiles come and raid the city, they took Lot captive and all of his possessions, because he's now dwelling in that city. Now come over to chapter uh, 19. Actually, we can stop in 18 for a moment. Now, I'm only explaining chapter 18. This is an interesting chapter, especially when we think about the salvation of God, because that's really what our studies are about. This is where God appears to Abraham. And, and by the way, Abraham took an army and, and delivered Lot and his family and delivered the, the, all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, brought, all, brought it all back. Abraham had that many servants that he fought five different kings and had victory over them. But he wouldn't take any possessions from them because God said he was going to bless Abraham. So Abraham delivered Lot that time. But now, so everything's back to normal again in those cities, except that here God appears to Abraham, and he's going to ex explain to Abraham what's going to take place before it happens. He's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham hears about this, and Abraham says, Lord, this is not like you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. And he starts out asking, what, what if there was 50 righteous people? Are you going to destroy that city? Lord said, oh, no, if there's 50 righteous there, I wouldn't destroy the city. So <laughs> Abraham said, wait, oh, wait, well, what if there's only 45? Will you destroy it? And the Lord says, no. It, well, how about if there's 40? The Lord said, no, if there's 40 righteous, I won't destroy it. He said, if there's 30? He said, no, if there's 30, I won't destroy it. He says, how about 20? Gets down to 10. Finally, he says, how about five? <laughs> and what it is, is what you have in chapter 19 is, is the five righteous. And actually it ends only being four, uh, three righteous. The, 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 there's not five. There's four righteous. And Lot's wife, she ends up turning into a pillar of salt because she looked back. But the, the three, Lot, he only has two daughters left under his provision. That angels go in in chapter 19 and actually deliver them out. Deliver the righteous from among them. But he, Lot is living there. But what I wanted you to see in chapter 19 is when those angels come and tell him. I mean, you, you can read the chapter. 
how the men of the city reacted to these angels coming into town. All, all kinds of perversions. But look at verse 15 of chapter 19. It says, And when the morning arose, the angels hastened Lot. They're hurrying him up. Say, hurry up, hurry up. Saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men lay hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they being brought forth, uh, uh, and set him without the city. Then they negotiate where they're going to go from there. When you get down to uh, verse 24, Then the Lord rained, uh, rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. I say this to you because the sin that were going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, sodomy, homosexuality, came time in which God was going to judge the wickedness of that city. And here's a righteous, the, the, the book of uh, Peter calls Lot a righteous man. Maybe not in his actions, he's right before God because he believes in the true God. And God knows how to deliver the righteous out from the ungodly. And there's a, it, here's how he did it. But, but it tells you how righteous people can get so much entwined in sinful, overt, perverted activity. So soon after the flood that Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom. Next thing you know, he's in Sodom. I left a verse out there that says that, that when Lot was in Sodom, that he was sitting in the gate of the city. Maybe I read it and forgot to bring that up. That means he's like one of the elders in the city now. He first looks toward it, lives in it, starts being a part of it, and when God says, I'm going to destroy it, rather than following those angels, say, hurry up, lead me out of here, those angels have to actually grab him by the hand and drag him out of the city. Because he's so used to living among all of that activity. Homosexuality starts, book of Romans, you got it marked there. Look at Romans chapter 1. Two things take place that cause that sin to develop. The first already took place, man isn't going to glorify God as God neither be thankful, and then he's going to live in his own imagination. In Romans 1 24 it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own flesh to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Now that's not homosexuality, that's just fornication. That's just living for the flesh itself, living in the lusts of the flesh. There's, you're going to change God, the glory of God into an image? Well if you're going to invent your own religion you might as well allow yourself some privileges, right? So they invent their own religion and they allow themselves privileges and they're living sinfully. But then it says in verse 25, they do something else. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their heir, which is meat. Receiving in themselves the payback of their sins, which is a proper judgment. Now, I want to talk about that, but what, they, what you see there are two things. They don't glorify God as God, became vain in their imagination. They're not thankful, became vain in their imagination. Next thing they know, they attack God's word and take the truth of God and turn it into a lie. And not only does God give them up to uncleanness, now he gives them up to what the Bible calls vile affections. So that things that were not even thought of before are just permeating, driven people's driving people's lives. Now we live in a society just like that, don't we? And when you talk about changing the truth of God into a lie, you know what society says today? And they want you to believe it? And you have to fight yourself because they're going to be able to try, they're almost able to convince you. They're going to say it's natural to be this way. I was born this way. God made me this way. And therefore that's why I'm this way. 
Now that's taking the truth of God and changing it into a lie because the truth of God says that's a vile affection. It's the result of, of turning from God and turning from the truth of God. God did not make them way, that way. It's not natural. It's a perversion of what God created. The natural use is man and woman. And in marriage, as God honors marriage. So it's not even fornication, it's marriage. And so the world will lie to us, and we're almost like, this, like Lot, where we see it, we kind of get used to it, we can move into San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, Royal Oak, and be comfortable living around that. And the rapture, God's going to have to take you by the hand to pull you out of it. Thank the Lord he can and will, huh? But we got to be real careful that the world isn't poisoning our mind and that we're getting used to things that the Bible calls vile. Now they'll probably arrest me someday for saying something like that, but the Bible says it. And what you see going on here is a, a de-evolution of man. The first thing that man did when he, when he wouldn't worship God as God, there is vile affections, there's a, the, the, the physical uh, flesh that man's turned to. There's physical repercussions from not believing in God. But when they take the truth of God and turn it into a lie, there is a, an emotional repercussion from that. When I look at this, notice that in verse 24, wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness, because they, they changed the truth, uh, because they glorified him not as God. So, there, and through the lust of the flesh. So there's a, you see the flesh in verse, uh, that verse in uh, work, in the verse 27, likewise men with men, le, uh, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their which is meat. Something is, when they turn to homosexuality, something is working in them that the Bible says it's fitting. Well, look at the next thing. Look at verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God, uh, God gave them over to a retrobate mind to do that which is not convenient. And then it starts listing all kinds of sinful actions and all. But you got the mind there. Up in verse 24, you got the lust of the flesh. You know what you got in between? See, you got the body, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You got man being given over physically, his soul being given over, and his spirit being given over to the sins that he's committing. And when I look at that receiving in themselves a recompense, I see an emotional reper uh, result <laughs> from, from the sins that they're doing. A repercussion for their sin. Just as one causes them to live wrong, the other one causes them not only to love wrong, but to think wrong. You know, in our society, we're emotional wrecks. People have no control over their emotions, and their emotions are running their lives. And, and, and those who get involved in this type of sin is a deep emotional scar. Some that's very hard to get past. I've talked to believers who got caught up in homosexuality and are finding it extremely hard to get themselves out of it. But they can get out of it, but there is an emotional scar that will scar them all their life. And... Uh, and so it's a sin not to be involved in, but it's also a sin that's the result of someone changing the truth of God into a lie. Uh, one, one, before time is going to get away, there's no before about it. <laughs> come, come over to uh, uh, Leviticus 18. I, two weeks or three weeks ago, I told you to read this chapter. Leviticus 18. Now watch this chapter. This is when, when, when we get into God's dealings with Israel, this will be another important chapter to look at. But right now we're looking at it in light of what I, what I was doing with you back in, in Genesis is we're looking at Ham and Canaan and realizing that Ham did something 
Canaan is known for something, and, uh, and here's a way that you would know what it is that Canaan was involved in, and, it, and it's leading to the giving up of the Gentiles to, their, to, them, to themselves and being cut off from God. In, in Genesis, uh, uh, no, in Leviticus 18, it says in verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. See, God belongs to Israel. After the doing of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, ye shall not do. And after the doing of the land of Canaan, where I, where, uh, whether I bring you, ye shall not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. So God's delivered Israel out of Egypt, so don't live like the Egyptians. I'm your God, do what I say to do. And when the land that I'm going to take you to, that land of Canaan, don't do the things that they do in that land. Now look over in verse 22. Here's some of the things. Now, there's a whole list, and it's all, it's all uh, um, incest type of relationships, all sexual immorality. But verse 22, among the list, it says, "Thou shalt not lie with mankind as lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination." That's homosexuality. Homosexuality is what? An abomination. Did I say that? No, God said it. God said it's vile affections. Verse 23, Neither shall thou lie with beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down unto, uh, unto it, uh, un thereunto it is confusion. It talked about all flesh corrupted its way. Defile ye not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these things, all these, the nations, are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore do I visit their iniquity uh, thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and, and not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, and the stranger that sojourn among you. For the, all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. Well, now you understand why Canaan is associated with Ham, don't you? It's, it's that tendency, the way that Ham began to go. His younger son Canaan, when he went and multiplied in the land of Canaan, they spread that immorality so badly that Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed early. Then eventually God brings the nation of Israel down to wipe out the Canaanites off of that land to cleanse that land because those are the sins of the lands was, those people in that land was committed. That's the heritage of us Gentiles. Now, I want to share, I want to close. Look to Acts chapter 17. I shared about half of what I wanted to say today. But, but, I, but I, I want to remind you that our study is about salvation. And just as... Romans chapter 9 tells us what happened to the Gentiles that got us cut off from God. We just looked at one third of what took place. <laughs> uh, but then, then when you come to the Apostle Paul, God's given us all, Jew and Gentile, another chance to be saved. Paul goes to Athens, Greece, where they thought they knew everything, and they don't know who God is, so they have an image called to the unknown God. Now Paul's going to explain to them who God is, and what opportunities we have in this age of grace. Look at chapter 17, verse 24. Paul's talking there. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that the Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So all your idolatry, God doesn't live in your temples, he is not in your idols and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That's the Tower of Babel. God divided the boundaries of the inhabitants of the earth, of the nations of the earth, where they were divided up. That they should seek after the Lord, if happily they may feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. God divided the nations out so that someone in those nations would start seeking who God is. And if they would seek Him, they would find Him. He's not far. But to, to, 
to, to disperse them in their idolatry so that they don't keep influencing each other in the negative against God. For it says, In Him we live and move and have our being, as also certain of your own prophets have said, for we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven, uh, graven by art and man's devices. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. Closed their eyes to us Gentiles. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Change your mind about that. And as you're going to see here, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now Paul talking about the resurrection, you know why Jesus Christ was, rose from the, was raised from the dead? For our justification. God has, there's a time he gave up on us, closed his eyes to us, but now has turned to all men and offered us another opportunity to believe. To believe what? That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again so that we could be declared righteous in the sight of a holy God. Cleansed and forgiven of all our sins. But don't forget the fact he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Jesus Christ who rose from the dead for our justification, if you don't trust him as your savior, you're going to meet him as your judge. And just like there was a judgment in the, top, in, the, in the flood of water upon the world that then was, there's going to be a judgment of fire upon the world that now is. But until that comes, God in his grace has turned to all mankind and offered us salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even for the homosexual. Homosexuality is a sin, but God loves the homosexual. He wants to save them and deliver them from that sin, first of all, from the damnation of the sin, but even from the consequence of living in that kind of lifestyle. But God loves sinners, and Jesus Christ died to pay for all sin. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that we study these things and we know some of the things of history. We see those things about us today. Uh, we try to make sense of these things and only your Bible can give us your God-given sense, your, your point of view, your mind about these issues. But Lord, I pray as well that as we study these things and see these things, I pray that your love... Uh, not emphasized today, but it's certainly there at the end. As the Lord Jesus Christ came into this sin-cursed world, dwelt among sinners, and suffered by the hands of sinners, death, burial, and resurrection, that he might be the savior of sinners. Father, I pray that your love has been expressed. I pray your love would be received, that the salvation that's in Christ would be received by believing that he died for our sins and was buried and rose again. And then, Father, help us to uh, study your word to realize how we can be honoring to you, whether it be mind, soul, or body, that we be used by you to glorify you in life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hymn 137, Precious, Precious Blood of Jesus. We'll just sing the first verse again as we're dismissed. Let's stand, please. Precious, precious blood of Jesus shed on Calvary. Shed for rebels and for sinners, shed for me. You're dismissed. <laughs>